I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this meeting for inviting me. And uh, a couple of months ago, I was asked to uh, provide a title. So uh, I uh, decided to talk about the recent work that we've been doing. And uh, that's about the uh, 20th century uh, story of the uh, nutrients, nutrient transport and biogeochemistry in rivers and the transport to the oceans. And uh, <clears throat> this is work by a uh, multidisciplinary group. Uh, you see here uh, different departments at the university, so it is really possible that uh, different departments work together. And uh, <clears throat> so multidisciplinary, it is a modeling uh, approach, coupling uh, hydrology, uh, climate data with uh, uh, models that uh, simulate the uh, delivery of nutrients and the biogeochemistry in rivers. So, um, uh, <clears throat> to give you an idea about the uh, magnitude of the uh, transport of uh, nutrients by rivers, you see here the, uh, well, let's say recent uh, estimates, uh, 40 million tons of nitrogen and 4 million tons of phosphorus uh, and for comparison, the global fertilizer uses about 100 million tons at present. And uh, so the uh, nitrogen export to the ocean is about a third. And uh, for phosphorus, uh, it is about a quarter of the fertilizer use. Of course, the nutrients exported uh, are not only from fertilizers, but also from natural sources and wastewater, etc. So... Um, <clears throat> the uh, rivers uh, are uh, quite different in uh, their nature. I will give two examples of uh, uh, a river, a European river, the Danube, 3,000 kilometers long. It drains about uh, 800,000 square kilometers. It has a population of 83 million, 60% uh, of which are urban, and the uh, dominant land use is agriculture. A completely different case is the Amazon. It is uh, 6,500 kilometers long. It drains nearly 7 million square kilometers. It has a population of only 10 million, mostly urban, and uh, natural ecosystems dominate the, uh, the river basin. Well, apart from these characteristics, of course, climate, uh, soils, and uh, geology are also different. So. The processes in these two rivers are completely different. So, um, to give you an idea of uh, the uh, importance of the various nutrient sources, uh, on the left you see uh, nitrogen, on the right phosphorus. The size of the circle indicates the uh, size of the delivery to surface uh, water from the land. And you see that in the course of the 20th century, the role of floodplains, that is uh, vegetation that is in flooded areas in river basins, is uh, uh, declining not only because the other sources are increasing, but also due to deforestation. Uh, and you see that in the course of the century, agriculture uh, becomes the dominant source, and that also the point sources, that is wastewater discharge from, from urban areas, is also getting uh, pretty important. And you even see Aquaculture, uh, if we extend this uh, to uh, 2010 or 2015, aquaculture would become also a significant uh, source of nutrient del delivery to uh, surface water. Um, I will guide you through this uh, scheme of a landscape let's, uh, with uh, soils and what is happening on the surface, uh, groundwater systems and transport pathways, and this is a stream. So, uh, I will start with what's happening on the uh, surface, that is the uh, nutrient budgets in uh, agricultural areas. Um, here you see uh, how we do that. Uh, the, uh, we consider the inputs of fertilizers, animal manure, biological nitrogen fixation and atmospheric deposition. And the outputs are what is harvested in crops or what is grazed by animals and uh, what is uh, mowed by, uh, by farmers, and also ammonia volatilization is a source that uh, needs to be accounted for when you look at 
how much potentially can go to the aquatic, to the hydrosphere. So uh, we um, take the difference of the inputs and the outputs, and that is potentially uh, moving into the uh, surface water. Um, now, uh, the uh, fertilizers is a uh, typical uh, or a very special case. We've seen that uh, in, in various talks, the, uh, the enormous increase since 1950 in uh, global fertilizer use. But what is also very uh, typical is that the molar N to P ratio in the fertilizer use is increasing. Here we see the global uh, picture with uh, ratios increasing from about 10 to 15, but it is even uh, more so in uh, Europe, where you see an increase from between 7 and 10 to maybe 20. So that's a huge change in the composition of the nutrients that is going to the land. And I will uh, come back to that later, how this, uh, this, uh, this works. <clears throat> One of the things that are important to know, uh, to understand, is uh, the um, efficiency in agricultural systems. Here you see uh, three regions that are completely different in the uh, uh, management of nutrients. I will start with an example, Western Europe, which is a very efficient nowadays uh, agricultural system. Uh, this is the inputs and this is the harvest from the aggregate of arable land, from all cropland in Western Europe. So, and the light gray, gray colors are 1970, and the darker colors are 2010. So what has happened, and that is the result of all kinds of um, uh, nitrate directives and nitrate vulnerable zones and all kinds of regulations at the European level that forced farmers to become more efficient. So this is 1970, and they moved their, their increased inputs and the harvest par, uh, harvested uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus also increased. So, but uh, as a result of the regulations, they started to increase the yield while they were decreasing the inputs. And that has happened both for nitrogen as a result of the regulations and here you see what happened to phosphorus. Uh, also a major decrease in the inputs to almost zero, while the harvest is still increasing. And this is a result of the massive loading of the soils. Uh, phosphorus is absorbed by soil, soil particles, stays there. Uh, that's, a, that's very different from nitrogen, which, which does not accumulate so much in soils. What phosphorus does because of the chemical absorption to soil part minerals. So by loading the soils, they increase the availability of phosphorus. And now, nowadays, we can do with much less fertilizer and even uh, zero fertilizer. And you see, if you draw the one-to-one -one line here, that uh, the system is even now depleting the soils. So the farms are uh, mining the soils. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is a result of prices of phosphate fertilizers, but it could well be. So a completely different history. Uh, this is due to regulations at the European level, and this is probably a price mechanism. Now, a, a different example, uh, Western Africa. You see, it in the first place, the level, the intensity of the system is much lower than in Europe, the, the inputs are much lower, and the harvest is also much lower. It is a kind of a medieval system with very low crop yields. And also for phosphorus, you see the same thing. So very low input, extensive agricultural system. And here you see a third example of a very inefficient, uh, high input uh, and, and very leaky agricultural system. Inputs are very high. That is because of uh, uh, in China, it, often two or three crops are grown per year. Also for phosphorus, very high inputs. And the output, if you look at the one-to-one -one line here, are very low, a very inefficient system. So three completely different examples. And if you add 
uh, this all up uh, and also include uh, natural ecosystems, then you see uh, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century a very uh, low input but very um, uh, balanced system, no, uh, very few losses. And uh, in the course of the century, you see in many parts of the world, like Europe in the 1950s, you see uh, budgets increasing, surpluses increasing. Uh, and in China and India, it starts in the 70s, uh, the same thing. Uh, very uh, typical case is the, is the former Soviet Union, where after 1990, fertilizer use dropped to zero. So you see there a mining uh, occurring, which is now still the case at present. So, um, if we now turn to our scheme and uh, look at the soil and groundwater processes, there are a few uh, things that uh, are important to understand. In the first place, uh, nitrogen can be removed by denitrification, both soils and groundwater. And um, nitrogen in groundwater has a long travel time. Uh, it varies from aquifer to aquifer. It also varies from which part in the aquifer. But travel times may be 10, 10 years or 50 years or maybe even longer. So there's a long history uh, and a lo memory of the system. And that may drive policymakers crazy because when they take measures to reduce nitrogen, uh, the effect will be visible only maybe after decades or maybe even a century, because the nitrogen is still on its way in the groundwater. It's very different for phosphorus. Phosphorus accumulates in soils because of the chemical sorption. Uh, so uh, when you uh, apply uh, uh, excessively uh, phosphorus, uh, it will stay there. There's a memory. So historical overdoses uh, can increase the, uh, cause increased P availability for crops, so you can uh, long afterwards, you can uh, benefit from the uh, historical overdoses. Um, now I will take you to uh, the wastewater, which is another source of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in, uh, in the world. Um, historically, uh, the uh, excreta would uh, go through open sewers or via uh, other pathways to uh, to the surface water, but in uh, many cities the waste was collected and recycled in agriculture. For example, in, in the city of Amsterdam, even at the beginning of the 20th century, this was still a very uh, um, um, good practice to recycle the waste. Um, <clears throat> in a more modern society, uh, people are connected to sewage, but there's still no treatment, so the waste goes directly to the surface water. And in, uh, for example, in Western Europe, we nowadays have, in many countries, we have advanced wastewater treatment. So um, uh, much of the nutrients in the uh, wastewater are removed and um, do not enter the surface water. So if we look at the 20th century again, you see that in many parts of the world, due to first connection to sewage systems, lacking uh, wastewater treatment, there was a huge flush of uh, uh, wastewater and nutrients to the uh, surface water. And at the end of the century, uh, for example in Europe, uh, treatment removed a lot of the nutrients, so you get a, a decrease again. Um, so this uh, wastewater is becoming a, an important source at the end of the century in many parts of the world. And, um, we will now have a look at the uh, total delivery of the uh, sum of the wastewater and the agricultural sources. And then you see uh, again the same uh, um, increasing uh, delivery of N and P uh, at the middle of the century, uh, followed by uh, India and China in the 1970s and uh, in Africa. Um, everything is still at a very low uh, extensive uh, level and there's not much connection to sewage water and uh, so uh, um, nutrient uh, problems in Africa are probably uh, yet to come. Um, the N to P ratios also uh, vary uh, in the course of time. Here you see uh, 
the green colors indicating high N2P ratios. Uh, first of all, in natural ecosystems where biological end fixation dominates, you have a high N2P ratio, by def uh, also because the soils and the uh, lithology is uh, not very P-rich here in tropical rainforest areas. But you also see an expansion of the area of uh, high N2P delivery uh, due to the expansion and intensification of agriculture in many parts of the world. Uh, North America, Europe, uh, China, India. So uh, ever uh, expanding areas that deliver uh, high N2P um, uh, water uh, to the surface water. Now, <clears throat> we also need to understand what's happening in the streams uh, where due to biogeochemistry there may be uh, changes uh, occurring. And one of the major changes that uh, uh, we have uh, caused is the construction of dams. Here we use uh, a data set of the 7,000 largest uh, dams in the world. There are tens of thousands of small dams that have not been accounted for and that are probably also very important for the uh, biogeochemistry, but we simply lack the data, so we used the 7,000 largest dams. And uh, here you see the uh, reservoir volume in the course of the century. Uh, blue colors uh, uh, indicate 500 to 1,000 cubic kilometers. So um, you see a rapidly increasing reservoir volume. And uh, this has consequences for the travel time of water, um, expressed in years here. So dark colors, 2 to 60 years. So uh, mankind has uh, increased the on average, the travel time of water by a factor of two in the 20th century. Um, so uh, this has consequences for the uh, retention of nutrients in the uh, surface water. Uh, the longer the, a nutrient needs to travel, the bigger the chance that it is uh, either trapped or uh, caught by bacteria to, uh, uh, and, and uh, will not uh, reach the ocean. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, shows the increase in the retention of uh, phosphorus. So darker colors, this is a fraction. So the fraction of the delivery that is uh, trapped in rivers or in lakes or in reservoirs. So um, you see uh, all over the world, you see increasing uh, P retention uh, uh, occurring as a result of the dam construction. So. Um, as a result of um, both the increasing delivery and the uh, increased trapping uh, in uh, rivers, yet the, uh, the um, uh, transport of the ocean is increasing. This is the Pacific Ocean, so all the rivers draining into the Pacific show an increase, and here uh, also the uh, uh, Pacific, uh, Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. Uh, all show uh, uh, increasing, but at different rates. Um, and we also see, as a result of the changing in, in agriculture and the uh, wastewater flows and the retention, an increasing N2P ratio in the uh, river export in various parts of the world. Um, now, there's another thing that is uh, important that may make uh, policymakers uh, wild. Um, there is an interaction between the two nutrients. Uh, P loading directly in freshwater systems leads to increased production. So, uh, and increased production leads to more sedimentation of uh, organic material, uh, um, um, decomposition, oxygen depletion, and under anaerobic conditions, denitrification may occur. So, more P leads to less N in the water. So. Um, this is actually uh, observed, uh, but the reverse has happened. Uh, we have tried to reduce the loads of P and N in the water, but by reducing P, uh, we uh, achieved that N is increasing. Less P means less denitrification, so uh, more N remaining in the water. 
So uh, this is expressed here by the uh, entropy ratios. This is the uh, series of large global lakes with increasing uh, entropy ratios. So uh, that's a very uh, uh, nasty thing because uh, at the same time, um, what may happen is the, uh, we have the memory of the groundwater system where nitrate um, um, may still be coming in the surface water that has been uh, entered, uh, entering the system decades ago. So um, <clears throat> both this uh, phenomenon and the uh, memory of the system may cause uh, that the uh, entropy ratios in rivers is, uh, is, is increasing, especially in, in Western Europe. So here we see this the, the total budgets of nitrogen and especially phosphorus, phosphorus going down. Uh, the sources, uh, this is agriculture, is going down, wastewater is going down, um, river export is going down. Uh, this is our modeled N2P ratio, but somehow in our model we missed something because this is what happened act, uh, in reality. This is the River Rhine, where in the 90s we had a peak, but now we also have a huge increase in the N2P ratio. Uh, and the same in the river, the Meuse uh, River, draining a uh, large part of France. So, um, also showing a, a major uh, rapid increase in uh, the entropy ratio. <clears throat> Why is all this important? Uh, algal blooms, uh, this is uh, in China, this is a warning in the Netherlands, this was uh, just prior to the Olympic Games the, where the sailing uh, competition was going to take place. Uh, was a, almost led to a disaster, but uh, they, uh, with a lot of... Uh, help, they could uh, remove all this biomass. This is another lake with, uh, with blooms. And, uh, but it's not only high biomass blooms that, uh, that are um, bothering us, uh, it's also toxic blooms. And it is uh, known from literature that especially high N2P ratios in the water uh, draining from rivers may lead to uh, toxic blooms. Uh, for example, paralytic shellfish poisoning. Uh, this is uh, observations from the 1970s, observations from the two th uh, years 2000. You see an increase. Uh, I don't, do not know whether this is a result of um, better monitoring of uh, uh, the occurrence of algal blooms or that it is a real uh, thing uh, occurring, but probably it is a real thing. And uh, it is coming very close to, uh, to my, uh, in my country. This is the province of Zeeland, and we had a, uh, an occurrence of uh, uh, Alexandrium, which is a paralytic shellfish poisoning species, uh, in a little canal here in Zeeland. And uh, this is the Oosterschelde, where the uh, mussel and oyster beds are. So if this uh, uh, species would escape from this canal and enter the Oosterschelde would be a real disaster for all the mussel and oyster farmers. So uh, what they did in 2012, they uh, tried to kill all the algae with hydrogen peroxide, but the uh, algae formed cysts which are at the bottom of the, uh, the sediment, and the next year the bloom was even bigger, and this uh, returns every year. So it's really, it's coming now very close. And it is, uh, I don't, do not know whether this is a result of the uh, changing composition of the uh, water, but it may well be. Um, so that is something very interesting. This is uh, data from the uh, UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Committee, HEDAT database, showing where uh, blooms have been observed. Unfortunately, Australia has not provided the data, but I'm sure that there are blooms here. So it's a very incomplete data set, so it's very difficult to uh, study relations between uh, changing river water composition and the occurrence of, uh, of blooms. This is another phenomenon caused by increased uh, uh, loading of coastal ecosystems. It has already been mentioned, hypoxic areas, eutrophic areas, Fortunately, there are also hypoxic uh, areas where there's improvement. 
And um, so um, I'd like to summarize. I think I can. Um, uh, 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 I, I discussed the rapid ac acceleration of the global nutrient cycles uh, uh, and despite increased retention, uh, there's increasing uh, export to the oceans. Industrialized countries already started to control nutrients, but uh, sometimes with, uh, with not the expected or the, uh, the hoped success, uh, developing countries will have to increase nutrients and probably uh, in order to secure food production, and that probably will, will lead to increased loading of uh, uh, surface water and uh, ocean, uh, uh, coastal waters. And uh, uh, especially in developing countries, urbanization and sewage connection will lead to a flush of nutrients like we have seen in the 70s in Europe too. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.